From around the world, I'm Henrik Palmgren. Thank you for returning to us as we continue our investigations into reasonable, outrageous, and controversial thoughts, opinion, and research on many of the topics that we follow and are interested in. The website is redicecreations.com. And for subscribers who enjoy the full spectrum of what Red Ice is all about, redicemembers.com is the website for you guys. Check it out. Today we're talking with Stefan Kinsella. He is a registered patent attorney and former adjunct professor at South Texas College of Law. Stefan has published numerous articles and books on intellectual property law, international law, and the application of libertarian principles to legal topics. We are going to discuss his book Against Intellectual Property with both some controversial and reasonable points. He urges us to rethink the very basis of intellectual property. He argues that the very existence of patents are contrary to a free market and adds in here copyrights and trademarks too. They all use the state to create artificial scarcities of non-scarce goods and employ coercion in a way that is contrary to property rights and the freedom of contract. So let's uh, get into it. Hi Stefan, welcome to Red Ice Radio. Thank you for coming on with us. Appreciate you taking some uh, time off talking with us today. Hope you're doing well. I'm doing very well. Thanks for having me on. I uh, and thanks for uh, letting me do it this way instead of traveling all the way to Sweden to uh, do it. It's a lot, uh, <laughs> a lot more convenient. Yeah, it sure is. We, we've come a long way, and it's uh, it's it's indeed interesting times. You no, know, but before we and we see if we can tie that in actually a little bit later in terms of uh, you know where we're heading when it comes to you know copyright and everything else and and things that are going on online right now because obviously these are big current issues. But before we get in talking about that and and your book against intellectual property. Uh, I just thought we could kind of introduce you a little bit um, and, and see where you're coming from. We had Walter Block with us about a week ago now, uh, your occasional co-author, I guess, on some of uh, a few of the articles out there. So people who listen to that will have an idea a little bit maybe. But you, you wrote a great article for uh, LouRockwell.com in 2002, basically on how I became a libertarian. That's a title uh, that talks about your basically your early aversion towards socialism and an attraction towards Ayn Rand's objectivism. But tell us how you went from that towards a more libertarian uh, view, Stefan, if you don't mind. Yeah, sure. Um, so I, I'm, I'm an attorney here in Houston. I've been practicing about 20 years and, uh, you know, been interested in philosophy and political theory and um, these types of issues for quite a long time. And, uh, you know, I was turned on to Ayn Rand in high school and quickly, uh, quickly, uh, uh, was attracted to her pro-individualist and pro-free enterprise and pro-individual rights ideas. Um, before that, I was just nothing. I, but I, I never have ever flirted with any form of leftism or socialism. It, it, it had never appealed to me. So I didn't really come from like a left to right or left to libertarian direction, just from nothing to libertarian or to Randian type libertarianism. Have you noticed that that's usually how it goes? Um, most people I know that uh, become libertarian tended to be, I think they tended to be one of the mainstream uh, you know either left or right before that right yeah in my experience um, there, there may be some like me that were kind of agnostic you know or I guess it depends how, how early you read some of the early works that's um, right yeah but Ayn Rand you know warned against um, anarchy and she warned against the libertarians and so I thought she made sense I mean I thought she was right because I, I figured she knew more than me so I at first didn't even read the libertarian books because I assumed they were terrible but I started seeing these brochures on campus at, at my college and I kept reading them and like this is very similar to Ayn Rand's capitalism <laughs> so I finally read it and you know read, read Rothbard and lots of the anarchists like the Tannehills, Lysander Spooner and of course, Bastiat and people like that, and uh, Nozick, and so, so finally, just became a, an Austrian 
and anarchist uh, libertarian. I still have a lot of strong uh, admiration for a lot of Rand's work. I think they went off the rails in a couple of ways, primarily intellectual property and uh, her pro-state ideas, which leads to confusion about war and some other foreign policy type issues. That's right. Yeah, I remember Walter talked about that too, that there seems to be a more pro, uh, pro-war pro sentiments within the, the philosophy for some reason. Right, yeah. Hmm. Uh, Hans Hermann Hoppe was, was a big influence on you as well, I think, uh, his provocative article, The Ultimate Justification of the uh, Private Property Ethic, right? It was, yeah. He, it's, there was a symposium in Liberty Magazine in 1988, I recall, which he, which he uh, spearheaded. He wrote this article. Um, he was Rothbard's sort of protege at the time, um, and it really influenced me, and I'm, I'm still a big adherent of that idea. It's, it's, it's his attempt to justify individual rights and set it on a, f- a firmer footing. It's different than the regular natural rights approach. And um, I, I, his book, A Theory of Socialism and Capitalism, which came out in 1989, I believe, I mean it's probably my personal favorite you know, nonfiction book I've ever read. It's just the one that I think is the, is the most concise, the most insightful, the most correct, um, just chock full of insight. So I just love that book. It's uh, underlined heavily. So yeah, he's a big influence. He's a good friend. I see him almost every year, um, either in Turkey where he lives or in Auburn or somewhere like that. Very good. Now, uh, also the legal principle of estoppel. Do I say that right? Yeah, that's right. Estoppel. Tell us about that. Well, so this is this um, old principle of the common law and uh, the civil law or continental law systems, which I believe Sweden is more or less a, a continental type system, they all have something like this. I think it's called promissory estoppel or there's some similar type of uh, doctrines in the law. In the law, the law says that in certain contexts or legal proceedings, you, you cannot take a stand that contradicts what you earlier said. So you can't like play play both sides. you know. Or if you make an admission early on, you can't deny that later. You're, they say you're stopped from denying it. Um, and when I thought about that, when I learned about it in contracts class in law school, uh, it, it occurred to me that a similar type of reasoning underlies the sort of symmetry of the libertarian non-aggression principle, right? Which says that y- you're only entitled to use force if it's in response to someone's force that was initiated. So initiated force is not permitted, but if you respond to force, it is permitted. And you could think of that as you could you could you could um, you could think of that being justified that rule that libertarian principle being justified by imagining that the the aggressor is really a stopped from complaining if he's treated if he's treated in a way similar to how he's treated his victim so in other words you, you can see why we would object to initiated force but there's really not there's no coherent objection that the aggressor could make if he is treated with force by his victims defense Exactly. Self-defense or, or even other types of, of response like uh, restitution or maybe even retaliation or revenge. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, so obviously we're going to get into intellectual property, um, talk more about your book against intellectual property. But why don't we talk just about property first before we kind of get into that and, and your view on that? Because we there, there's still obviously a lot of people out there who have a, uh, you know, an idea that that we can't own anything as human beings or that nothing is really our property, etc. Mm-hmm. But w- what's your view on this then, Stefan? Um, I start from where basically Hoppe starts from. And you know, these insights are not all original with him, but he is the first one that I'm aware of who really explicitly lays out the kind of basis of of social theory and property rights. And what, and what he recognizes, which others have recognized, like David Hume and and others, is that really the, the fundamental basis – uh, the need the need for law, the need for rules arises because of the fundamental problem of what he calls scarcity, by which what we really mean is ri- uh, rivalrousness. That is, we have certain goods in the world that only one person can use at a time. There's a means of action. Um, and so what this means is there's a possibility of conflict over them. Like if two people try to use the same tool or the same object or the same piece of food, only one can use it, and they're going to have to resort to physical violence and clashing um, for one of them to finally get it. So the entire purpose of property rules is to find a way to assign – to say which person is entitled to use that thing. Now, no, I don't understand how people can be against property rights. Um, they might differ on who we should give the right to, but almost everyone has to be in favor of property rights because 
you can't deny that there are things that we need to use in the world, and you can't deny that using it is an exclusive type of activity in some cases, and that without some kind of this rule that's socially recognized that says who gets to use the thing, then you're going to have physical violence, or no one gets to use it, and, and it would just go to waste. So you really – it's really hard to deny that we need some socially recognized rules for get, who gets to own the thing. Now, the libertarian distinction, what makes us different than every, pretty much every other political philosophy, which in my opinion are always some variant of really in effect pro-slavery or socialist or statist type of mentality. Yeah. Only, only the libertarian has the rule that says – it's basically the, the, the Lockean rule. It says that, look, whenever we have an, a scarce resource out there that is some physical resource in the world that's useful, then the owner of it is whoever – first appropriated it and used it because when you do that, you have to have a better claim than anyone else because no one could object to your homesteading or appropriating some unowned resource because if they object, that would be asserting an act of ownership. In other words, only the owner of something can tell me not to use it. So if we assume that it's really unowned, then the first person who uses it is not violating, violating anyone's rights. So no one can really object to that. And so that's why the Lockean rule makes sense. Now, that's for externally acquired resources, and, and then you could transfer it by contract. So the only two rules are first appropriation or original, you know, original appropriation or homesteading, and then contract. So the owner could then give it to someone else by contract, by uh, consenting to someone else having the thing temporarily or permanently. So you could loan it or lend it or invite someone to your house for a meal, in which case they, they have like a temporary property right in your in your resources, um, or or it's a it's a complete sale where you abandon it totally in favor of the other person. But then this doesn't cover your body. The, the body is another type of scarce resource, and some people object to the idea of self ownership. They say it's incoherent because there's no distinction between you as a person and your body, um, or they assume that you're making some religious argument, like you're assuming there's a soul that owns the body or something like that. But I don't think it's really that complicated. It's, it's, you, you can be an atheist. You can be a mystic. You can be a theist. You can believe in a soul. You can not believe in a soul. It really doesn't matter. The question arises, who gets to control that body? And yeah. there, do, there do arise disputes about it. If a man wants to kiss a woman on her lips, does he get to do it if she says no or, you know, or, or, or does he not? Mm. Who, who gets to decide? Does she get to decide or does he get to decide? And to, to answer that question, you only need to identify her as a legal person. That means she has an identity and to know that bodies can be clashed over. You don't have to get into the metaphysics of what the person really is and whether it's distinct from the body. It doesn't really matter. And I think all these arguments are evasions because if you object to self-ownership, the only alternative is, is other ownership or which is or, – or you don't – or no one owns your body, or, or, right, which is yeah. – uh, so, so I don't think it's really that controversial, but, but let me make one comment about the word property. I, oh, in recent years, I have tended to try to be really careful about how I use the word because it leads to a lot of confusion. Um, I almost think the word – like the word capitalism maybe should be – I won't say banished from, from libertarian discourse, but it has to be kept really carefully in mind. Um, it, originally, it was used, say, by Locke. To, to talk about an aspect or characteristic of your person, right? Say, if you mix your labor with something, it becomes a property of you. He, he, he wouldn't call it a piece of property like it's a thing that's called property. So nowadays we commonly would say like if I own a car, it's my property. But what people think of when they say that, they think of the thing is a, is a piece of property. But what the word originally meant was it's a it's a characteristic of yourself. It's an extension of yourself because you can use it usefully to, to, do, to get things done. Yeah. Um, but really the way I would look at it is this. There are, there are material objects in the world or scarce resources, and uh, sometimes there's an owner. Someone is legal, recognized to have the legally exclusive right to use that resource. So you could say that I have a property right in that resource, or you could alternatively say, I have an, I'm the owner of that resource. But all these ways of formulating it mean is that there's a scarce resource out there, and the, there's some legal system that is respected and you know, uh, rec recognized in society that identifies which person has the right to control and use that resource. 
So you really don't even need the word property, but if you're going to use it, you have to recognize that it just means you have a property right in that thing. Now, the reason I think we need to be careful about it is if you are not careful about it, you lose sight of the fact that we're always, always talking about in, – in the case of law and rights and property rights, we're always talking about identifying the owner of a material, conflictable, scarce resource. Mm -hmm. That's always the inquiry. If you lose sight of that, then the intellectual property idea arises where you just start talking about uh, that idea is my property, okay? Yeah. Um, and, 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 or you know, I created that in that mousetrap or that, that uh, rocket ship design or that airplane design, so I own it because I own what I create. And when you start talking like this really kind of loosey-goosey, non-rigorously, you lose sight of the fact that um, you can't just – come up with a concept that we can attach a word to and assume that it's an ownable thing. The entire purpose of property rights, as I mentioned earlier, is to address this fundamental problem of conflict, which arises from the fact that there are scarce resources. If there were no scarce resources, we were all little demigods that could conjure up whatever we wanted in the blink of an eye. If conflict was physically impossible between people, uh, it's almost hard to imagine such a world. But if in such a world, there would be no such thing as theft. There would be no such thing as violence. There would be no such thing as aggression. There would be no need for property rules. Property rules, in fact, would make no sense whatsoever. And of course, in the limit, no action would be possible because human action requires scarce means and requires you to not be perfect, which is one, one reason. I mean, Mises has an allusion to this in, in human action, um, that if there was a god, uh, if he, he really couldn't act because to act implies you're dissatisfied with what's going to come, and you're trying to change the state of affairs. <laughs> and if yeah. God's dissatisfied, that means he's not perfect, and if he's not perfect, he's not God. So right. <laughs> you could even argue that if you're such a perfect little demigod or, or spirit that no action is possible and certainly no property rights are possible or necessary. So if you keep in mind when we talk about this, we can have a debate about who's the rightful owner of something. I happen to think that the first person who gets it has a better claim than someone else. And that if the second person comes along and takes it, he's basically a thief or a trespasser. Right. But if you want to argue that my prop, my property – see, I'm misusing the word. Too, if the resource that I own is transferred by, from me to someone else without my consent, you could argue that the guy that gets it is the rightful owner. Okay, but you have to come up with a reason for that. Um, and th that's, what, that's where the libertarian debate comes down to, the, the debate between libertarians and every other uh, political theory. Very interesting. And as we get into some other aspects to this, it, it gets even more interesting. We're right now there are, you know, conversations about DNA, basically, who, who owns that? Monsanto is looking to patent genes, you know, and then we get into uh, digital articles and everything else that's tied to, you know, intellectual property. But before we go there, you mentioned also the word capitalism, that that also should be used carefully. Can you explain that a little bit more? Well, there's a couple of reasons. Um, uh, I mean, the, the leftists and left libertarians, um, have have somewhat of a good point when they argue that we shouldn't use the word capitalism as a sort of synonym for the free market laissez-faire system that libertarianism favors, for example. And one reason for that is you know the historical origin of the term as a smear word. I don't put much stock in that argument because you know sometimes people take a term and they they adopt it proudly and they 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 go on with it. Um, I do think the word capitalism has gotten confusion partly because of the efforts of left libertarians to, to do so, um, but it's sort of an ambiguous term. Sometimes it means the current Western system in the world today, and sometimes it means the ideal system we would be in favor of. So right. there's a potential for confusion. But even if you accept, say, Rand's meaning of it, which would be the, like a pure laissez-faire economy, Capitalism, even in its best sense, only refers to the uh, one aspect of the economic order of a free society. It doesn't refer to the entire economy, and the economy, of course, is not all of society either. So you're isolating one feature of, of, of the, the economic aspect of society and identifying all of freedom with that. Um, yeah. And I, I do tend to agree that in any advanced – libertarian society, you would have a pure capitalist system operating, but it wouldn't be the whole system. It wouldn't be all of it. So um, I tend not to say I'm an anarcho-capitalist anymore, although I don't get offended by that. I say anarcho-libertarian or libertarian anarchist like Gerard Casey, the uh, Irish philosopher 
does in his recent book, Libertarian Anarchism, mm. uh, you know, to distinguish our type of anarchy from, um, you know, from other types of anarchism, left anarchism, syndicalism, those types of things. Right, right. Um, and I think so. I so I would even sometimes say Austro anarchist, although I don't think you have to be an Austrian exactly to be um, a libertarian. But I do think they they do complement each other strongly. It does get more and more refined the more we research and look into these things and theorize, philosophize, and argue and everything else. It's it. There's so many different branches out there now. But that's a good thing, I think. That's it's excellent. That's the point of it, right? We we advance forward in our thought, uh, our our opinions. And we, you know, argue accordingly to to come to a realization and and the truth, right? Yeah, and there's actually some. I mean, there's other words that probably would have been more appropriate than even libertarianism because libertarianism refers to liberty or freedom. But even liberty and freedom are not fundamental concepts because you really have to know who owns a given scarce resource that's in contention to decide who has the liberty to use it, right? So the more fundamental concept is property rights. Uh, or ownership of scarce resources, which has its root in 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 in, um, uh, in in the desire to avoid conflict. Um, I mean, I think the word socialist might have been a better word if it hadn't been taken by the by the other guys. Um, uh, Henry Hazlitt had pr proposed, I think, the word cooperatism, which I really like. It sounds too much like corporatism or or, or some other. Words, but it, it gets at the, the the fundamental basis for libertarianism is the desire for peace, human prosperity, cooperation among people. So, mm -hmm. yeah. and, and so all the other rules flow from that. If you just have a bit of sincerity and economic literacy and consistency, then the rest of the rules come out of that. But the basic desire among a core of, of society and civilized people for peace and prosperity, some kind of way to get along with each other, where we can all live. Happy lives in this world by by being prosperous. Um, so I think cooperatism would have been a good word too. But I think libertarianism is is you know is fine. And uh, when one is attempting to describe the economic system, free enterprise, free market, would that be a better choice? Do you think? I think so. I think free market. Uh, I don't like the, this left term, freed market with a D on it. It's just a little too uh, a little trying too hard, I think, and a little <laughs> too cutesy. But um, I understand what they're getting at, uh, but uh, yeah, I say free market or, or laissez-faire laissez-faire system. But I do think it would be characterized by a type of pure capitalism or laissez-faire capitalism, you could say. Right. Now, there's another thing I was thinking about here. You you talked about scarcity before, um, and I wanted to ask you if you heard about some of the other uh, theorized solutions that have been floating around out there for that, such as, for example, a resource-based economy, or in some, in some way there, there seems to be a belief as well that future technology is going to solve this issue that in the future we're going to we're going to have a utopia and therefore you know we will be able to manufacture or replicate everything that we need kind of in a star trek style manner if you know what i mean <laughs> have you heard about some of these ideas floating around out there what do you think about them yeah i think they're very interesting i i think it, it helps to be kind of clear and distinguish them and see how they relate to each other um i i, I totally disagree with say this Star Trek idea that we don't need, you know, we're going to, in, in the future, we won't need money, for example, right. because uh, yeah. we'll, pa we'll go get past the money system because money, you know, money is a special thing. It, it, um, uh, it permits economic calculation. It permits rational economic action. Um, uh, it permits cost accounting. Um, so I don't think we're going to get rid of money. Um, but, and I also don't think we'll ever reach a completely post-scarcity in the sense of having no possibility of conflict. Um, the world is a world of scarce means. I mean, w we can't act, even if we're some kind of reason, artificial intelligence, uh, you know, uh, computronium clusters in the galaxy someday. <laughs> there's still going to be uh, some real means employed to get things done, even if we can't comprehend it. So I think there's always going to be need for some form of, of property rights allocation. Um, and so that and there's always going to be some scarcity, Stefan, as well. There's always going to, we're always going to find some thing that cannot be, you know, attained by everybody, and that right. will become a, a currency of sorts, if that's so, right? It's possible. I mean, I've read, you know, science fiction type ideas that maybe in the future the currency would be some kind of, uh, you know, uh, just your your social reputation ranking or something like that. When um, and this is where I meant we have to distinguish different senses of the word. The, the problem with the word scarcity is that it kind of has two meanings. The kind of technical economic meaning 
really has to do with rivalrousness. So when you say that's a scarce good, you mean that it is a good that is of the type that that good itself can only be used by one person at a time without conflict, even if there's a billion of them, even if there's a trillion of them. So uh, in the common sense, scarcity means lack of abundance. Now, and I think that so, – so imagine this, this land of milk and honey where there's just banana trees everywhere. <laughs> Right. So each banana, or like the ocean, if you go get a, a pail of water out of the ocean, the ocean is basically non-scarce in, in the sense that there's so much of it that we can't exhaust it right now. Um, but each pail of water that you take out becomes a scarce resource that you have ownership of, and if someone takes it, they're, they have to use violence to take it from you. But – so let's imagine these bananas. Let's, so each banana is technically a rivalrous resource, or we would say in economics a scarce resource, even though bananas, we wouldn't say they're scarce. They're so plentiful that they're everywhere. But in such a world, I think you, you see like a, um, the, the common idea of scarcity in the limit tends to the economic idea of scarcity. And what I mean by that is let's say that technically I have a banana and I own the banana. But would there really be property rights enforced in such a society uh, about bananas? I mean, first of all, if you wanted to take the banana from me, why would I care? Because I could just reach up and grab another one. So you're not really harming me. I wouldn't care. Um, and why would you take it from me? Because you can grab your own banana in any second. So if, if there's such superabundance in a practical sense of a given actually rivalrous good… I don't know if we would actually invest a lot of time and effort to have property rights about it because it wouldn't be worth it any more than you know, you might not walk half a mile to pick up a penny that's on the road somewhere because it's just not worth the effort. Yeah. Right. Or 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 when in very rich societies, people sometimes just, you know, give a guy in the line at Starbucks a dollar if he's short a dollar, some stranger because a dollar is so plentiful and we're so rich now. You can afford to be so charitable. So w what I was thinking was if we if if we come to a post-scarcity world, what that to me means is that we have such advanced economic productivity and prosperity primarily because of an advanced degree of capitalism and technology that everyone's needs could be met. I mean let's say everyone had a universal replicator machine, and you could just grow a new house in a day, and let's say there's free energy. I don't know. Mm. Um, in such a world, everyone is so… Basically, so wealthy that the, the possibility and the necessity, uh, just the, the, the phenomena of disputes and conflict would go, I would think it could go down to almost zero. You'd still have the potential of murder and things like that, and maybe that's where the, uh, the, the legal system's resources would, would point to. But if everyone is so rich that you really don't have any fear of theft, you might not need a strong legal system because there might not be any problem to worry about. Just like in certain safe societies, people still leave their front doors unlocked. In their houses, right? Um, but I do not think, as a practical matter, we're ever going to reach a truly non scarce, uh, post scarcity society. There will always be some rivalrousness, there will always be the possibility of conflict. Yeah. Um, well, that has to do so with human the, nature, yeah. Stefan. That has to do with how we are as human beings and, and the fact that we have, you know, there are psychological components and, and, you know, sickness and all kinds of things, mental sickness that are you know, involved in this question as well, of course. Yes. Yes, I agree. Um, uh, now you mentioned something about there's always scarcity. I think in energy or something like that. I don't. I don't know enough about physics and the universe to know that. That seems right to me. But who knows what someone might come up with someday? Some kind of a, a virtually free energy source, and you know maybe maybe we can humans can find a way to stop a. Uh, Stop entropy and stop the universe from aging someday. <laughs> I've ever read all these crazy science fiction novels about going into the future and right. sending you know, asteroids back to now to balance out the universe's eventual collapse. And uh, who knows? I mean, <laughs> I, this is millions of years off. <laughs> but but that, uh, we, as a practical matter for the next million years, I think that we need property rights and law. Well, exactly. No, no, that's my thing as well. It's like, okay, we, we're not there yet and everything. That's what I'm saying. People are putting their, fa their faith just in the future that will be resolved then. But the fact is the, the issues and everything remains now. And the fact is we don't even know if we will attain that level yet. But uh, there's a lot of interesting ideas here, of course. It kind of ties into where we're going with this in terms of, uh, ideas as well, uh, w you know, where ideas come from. If we do own them, for example, you talked about inventions in terms of free energy and everything else. What you know, where they come from. But let, let's get into intellectual property then, and how that that differs from from just property. W what is intellectual property, and what do you uh, 
Uh, what's part of that category, if we can call it that? Yeah, so intellectual property is um, a type of legal right recognized by virtually all state legal systems in the world today. Um, in its systematized modern form, it's been around for a couple of hundred years. Before that, it was more spotty, and, and its origins came from uh, grants of monopoly by the government, uh, like in, in Europe primarily. Um, patents, they call letters patent, they would call them sometimes, or some kind of monopoly grant to someone to be the only one in a given region who could manufacture or trade in a certain substance. And uh, this wasn't because they were the inventor, it was just because the, the king was giving a favor to this guy and letting him have a little monopoly. This was the age of protectionism and uh, mercantilism. Um, and also, that's patents. And copyrights, which is another form of intellectual property, arose from the practice of the, the church and the government conspiring to, pro to regulate which books could be disseminated and printed. Okay, so it was censorship and thought control, I mean quite literally, yep. uh, and there's really no debate about this. Um, so intellectual property now includes the, mo the current modern forms of patent and copyright. Patent is the system which gives protection for inventions, which are practical, technical you know, gizmos and processes, and copyright protects the artistic expression of some like literary work or a creation or work like a book or a novel or a painting – or computer code uh, even, um, and other types of intellectual property. And they call it this because – well, they call it this because they, they were trying to justify it after getting assaulted by the free market economists in the 1800s who saw this as nothing but a grant of monopoly privilege by the state. So they started calling it intellectual property to try to tie it in with these natural rights ideas and, and – uh, uh, private property ideas in the, say, U.S. Constitution and the U.S. founding and in the writings of the, um, you know, the pro-liberal uh, European thinkers. So they were trying to give it that patina of, just, uh, of, uh, of justifiability by calling it property. It was just a propaganda ploy. Um, but they call it that because it has to – it's legal protections for things that have to do with the creations of the mind. So the other forms that are recognized – would be trademark, okay, which is like a, a mark or a symbol or a, a brand name of a product which identifies the source of that product like Nike, Coca-Cola, um, and trade secrets, which is when you have a, a valuable information that is valuable to you so long as you keep it secret, you know, like a, a, a formula for Coca-Cola or uh, – which is actually not a trade secret because it's – it's, that's a, that's a, uh, an urban myth, an urban legend that it's secret. Uh, the, the formula is actually known. You can find it on, on, online, huh. <laughs> but there are some secrets out there. Um, sure. um, and uh, uh, so that helps you get a competitive advantage, you know, customer lists, things like this. And then there's more modern things too, like boat hole designs. In, in, in some parts of Europe, there's mo what's called moral rights, which is the right to be recognized as the author of something, even if you don't have the copyright anymore. Or even the right to stop your your work from being destroyed or defaced, even after you sold it. Mm. I think there's some there's some case in somewhere in Europe, maybe France, where some artist had painted his refrigerator and he sold his apartment, and he got a court order to stop the uh, the new owner from destroying the refrigerator. <laughs> so I think because, you know, he's got to res preserve the integrity of that work. Oh, wow. Sort of like these sort of like these laws that prevent you from tearing down historic buildings right. once the government designates them as historic. Yep. And, and so it's really kind of arbitrary that – why isn't that called intellectual property? What about laws that prevent you from desecrating the flag? I mean in a way that's a type of intellectual property. Um, it, what about counterfeiting laws, You know, the government's money laws? The, in a way those are a type of intellectual property because they're saying – only we have the right to print this pattern of paper on our notes. That's you know, right. They don't call it copyright, but it's a type of copyright. Yeah. Um, so that's why they call them intellectual property. Uh, I think what the the, and the, the the two most virulent, damaging, and harmful forms are patent and copyright. And I think copyright is probably the worst. Um, my my estimate is that patent probably causes about, I don't know, say half a trillion dollars of economic damage in the United States every year alone um, and worldwide. The, I, I'm, I'm shuddered to try to calculate it. Mm. Copyright causes damage to and distorts the culture, but, it, but its harm is more in the police state direction. Like it, 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 it actually causes people to go to jail. It censors people's free speech. 
and freedom of expression and freedom of the press, and it, it puts some people in jail. And it also is giving the government uh, the excuse to ratchet up um, uh, surveillance activities and uh, on the internet to cut back on internet freedoms with these six strikes in your outlaws, banning people from the internet, extraditing British college students, um, you know, to America to face yeah. prison charges for right. having a website that had the wrong kind of links on it. Um, so uh, they're both they're both horrible. I guess if I could get, get rid of only one, I would have to get rid of copyright because it lasts so long; it's over a hundred years. Um, and so, then what the U.S. and the Western countries have done, which is sneaky and shady, is they the U.S. is foisted on the rest of the world primarily to protect our pharmaceutical industries and, and Hollywood and the and the music industry, which we sort of took the early lead on um, in the in the you know in the 1900s. Um, they foisted all these international treaties like the Berne Convention and the, the, the Patent Cooperation Treaty and the Paris Convention, all these international treaties on the world which require every signatory country to have certain minimum standards of protection. And then there's GATT and the WTO. Um, and so then the U.S., w when people start saying we need to modify U.S. copyright law, it's really harmful. We need to maybe – uh, put formalities back in like we used to have where you, you don't get it automatically. You have to register it for it actively. Or let's reduce the term from 70 years after your death to, to 50 again or to 20. And then the, the, the defenders of IP will say, oh, we'd love to do that, but we can't. We have these international treaties that we are obligated to, to respect. So they basically shackled their own hands on purpose and that of the rest of the world with these treaties so that they can't even really have a reasonable modification – um, of these laws. It's quite astonishing. Indeed. And, and now one of your points that I listened to as well, Stefan, was that you, you, you know, you argued this from the point of view of the constitution as well. There was actually unconstitutional in consideration with some of the amendments to the constitution, right? Yeah. Well, that's a, that's a U.S. point only is sure. it, yeah. probably most other legal systems. It's, uh, you have less of an argument there, uh, but given that the United States is unique, uh, federal government structure, which is a government – so it's the most powerful government in history and on the planet, but it's a government of limited and enumerated powers, unlike every other state, which is supposedly a, a, a government with police powers or plenary powers. In other words, general legislative power. The United States government is supposed to only have certain enumerated powers. Of course, it disregards most of these limits. <laughs> yep, that's right. <laughs> but so, so yeah, there are several arguments that could be made um, – um, for why in the U.S. patent and copyright law are unconstitutional, and one argument is uh, um, well, not just patent and copyright, but trademark and trade and federal aspects of trade secret law. Right. And the first argument would be so the Constitution in, was ratified in 1789. There is a clause that authorizes Congress, if it wants to, it doesn't have to, but if it wants to give authors and inventors for limited times the exclusive right to their writings and discoveries. Okay. And what people interpret that to mean as co is copyrightable works, that's writings, and discoveries. But it doesn't authorize trademark law. It doesn't authorize f f trade secret law. Those are done on the state level. But the government – the federal government passed the Lanham Act, which is a big trademark law, on the grounds that they can regulate interstate commerce. So if – so I think that's clearly bogus. I think that's a, that's a, that's a stretching of the interstate commerce clause to turn it into a general – basically a general legislative power clause, which it was not meant to be. Um, so that's one reason trademark law, and, and there are some federal aspects of trade, se trade secret law. If, if you steal someone's trade secret, they call it, then that's actually, you can go to jail, federal, it's a federal crime in some cases. It's almost like espionage. Okay, so, so those two are just not authorized in the Constitution. And the other argument is, well, another one is just look at the power grant. First of all, it says to promote the, to promote the progress of science and the arts. Yeah. Well, the evidence that's been accumulated in the last 200 years uh, seems to indicate strongly that uh, that uh, patents distort and suppress innovation and impose billions of dollars of cost on the economy, so it doesn't promote the progress of the useful arts. And copyright law distorts culture heavily, and there's plenty of evidence and reason to believe that it's simply not necessary and does not stimulate – artistic creation. It would, it, would, it would occur without it. In fact, you'd have more without it. So that's the, the first thing is that, is that the, the laws actually do not promote the progress. So that's one, another argument for their 
unconstitutionality. Uh, another one would be that it says that Congress can protect authors in their writings. Well, then how does that cover a painting? How does that cover um, um, a movie? How yeah. does that cover audio recordings? Those are not writings. So it should it should only refer. And how would it cover a map? It should really refer only to, you know, a, a novel, a written book. Okay, if you're really going to be li literal about it. Yeah. Well, that's it's, it's that's what it granted. And then for discoveries, I mean, in, actually, what's interesting about that is most libertarians who defend intellectual property and patent law, they say that, well, patent law is okay because it doesn't protect discoveries. It only protects inventions, which is like an innovative improvement in a given process or design, a way to do something. So they, they sort of argue that patent law doesn't protect discoveries and shouldn't protect discoveries, but that's really all that it's authorized to do. But so like the court the other day, the Supreme Court the other day, uh, one reason it ruled against patents on human genes, right. genes is that they're, 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 they're discovered by scientists. They already exist in nature, yeah. right? But they said if you create a synthetic one, maybe you can get a patent on that. So they left that possibility open. Well, that's what Monsanto is doing now, right? They're modifying the genes to be able to patent it. Yes, yes. And there, there's a lot of cases about Monsanto and their, and their – their, um, their, uh, their plant patents. And they're, by the way, plant patents are authorized in the patent law too. The, the patent law, by the way, in the U.S. and in most countries has utility patents, which are what you think of as a regular type of invention. It has usefulness or utility, mm -hmm. but also usually plant patents, uh, which are asexually reproduced plants. Um, and, um, and also uh, in some countries there's uh, – uh, well, there's, there's other types of patents. There's design, design patents, which are kind of like copyright. There's the, it's the ornamental aspects of things. But in any case – so anyway, but the more radical argument I think you could make is that um, there is no doubt. I mean Cong the Supreme Court recognizes that there's a conflict between freedom of speech, which is protected in the U.S. by the First Amendment, and the, the effect of copyright law because it just literally says you cannot publish a certain book. Like I couldn't publish a sequel to to Atlas Shrugged if even if I wrote it, you know, on my own, I would get sued. And I would be prohibited from actually publishing it. So that's the type of control of freedom of the press and freedom of speech. Mm -hmm. So what the court has said is that well, they're both in the Constitution, so there's a tension between them. So we have to balance them out, and we have to make a decision on a case by case basis. But the but the argument fails, I believe, because. The First Amendment was enacted in 1791. It was ratified two years after the Constitution was, was – itself was ratified. So you had the copyright and the patent clause in 1789, and then two years later, you had the Bill of Rights. And to the extent there's a conflict between these provisions, the later one should be the one that governs, just, just like um, the U.S. first had prohibition by amending the Constitution to outlaw alcohol. And then when we had enough of the drug war that caused in the – that we, um, we, we passed another amendment, which repealed the other one. Now, the only reason this, the Second Amendment repeals the earlier is because it came later. Just like any legislature of a government can pass a law that changes or repeals an earlier law. So the later law always is the one that has priority. And so if there's a conflict between the Bill of Rights and, and the Copyright Clause, then you shouldn't balance them. You should just strike down the law that violates the Bill of Rights. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think it also uh, – patent law also causes uh, censorship as well. I can give examples of that too. It, it's not designed to do that, but it does in some cases. Um, and I think copyright law also violates the, um, the Fourth Amendment, which protects uh, papers and our, 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 our privacy because it's leading to all these uh, draconian rules for you know, so investigating businesses for having pirated software and the six strikes – and your outlaws and all the internet surveillance, things like that, yep. SOPA and PIPA. Um, it also violates the due, due process of the Fifth Amendment because uh, quite often your, your rights are taken away from you without due process. You're just assumed to be an infringer. And I think it violates the Eighth Amendment too, which prohibits excessive fines and cruel and unusual punishment because the copyright law has these insane statutory damages like hundreds of thousands of dollars per infringing act. And I mean, some economists uh, have calculated. It was a law professor named John Tehranian. He did a calculation. He said, if you took the copyright law in the U.S. literally and seriously, and looked at the worst possible penalties 
that you'd be liable for for an average person like you or me using the internet. Not even someone pirating and bit torrenting and all this kind of stuff, but just sending emails to people, forwarding web pages, you know, photographs, uh, having writing reports, uh, copy, copying a friend's CD to get music from it. He estimated that you could potentially be liable for four point five billion dollars per person per year. I mean, it's just insane. So there's no way you could argue that anything remotely in that level doesn't violate the Eighth Amendment's uh, ban on excessive fines. So there are several grounds which could be argued um, against, and of course they're unjust as well, which is another good argument against them. There's a lot of components of this that, that we can and should get into. We're going to take a break in a little bit here, but um, let's talk one more thing here before we get you know, get to that uh, or take a short break. Let's let's take BitTorrent as an example then, and, and how we view this. Uh, you know, as we get into some of the examples, you know, we have Hollywood filmmakers, producers. They uh, pour millions of dollars into into a film. You know, uh, mm-hmm. then it spreads online, Pirate Bay, yes. what have you. You know, people downloading the movie for for free, and now one extension to to this uh, you know problem as well is uh, you know one of the Pirate Bay founders, uh, Gottfried Svartholm, who the Swede who is actually jailed now on a one year sentence due to. Uh, he's he's part of you know setting up Pirate Bay, and now more recently a court decided to give him I think two more years actually for an alleged hacking into government computers or something like that. But w- how do you sort out this this mess of what's going on there and what should be legal and what shouldn't? Should people be able to then download you know things that are being created for free that's available online? You know how how do you view this? So I would distinguish I would distinguish between hacking and spam and and um, cyber trespass from from uh, piracy um and i I would i I, you can come up with an argument for for why like say uh, hacking is a type of crime uh even if it's even though it's remote what you're doing is you're using scarce means that have a causal efficacy in the real world you're using some method to control and gain access to someone else's scarce resources their their computer system so you're using their computer system without their permission um you know, just like if you pick up the phone and call me, you're causing my phone to ring, but now I've I've extended an implicit invitation for you to do that. But if I rescind that invitation, then you're using my property without my permission. If you knock on my door, presumably you have some kind of limited uh, implied license to do that or permission, right? Because we're neighbors, and you, when you have a door, you're kind of sending a message to the world. <laughs> this is my property, mm-hmm. or this is my resource, but you have the right to walk up to it for innocuous purposes and knock on my door to ask me a favor. But if I put a big sign up saying, you know, no trespassing allowed, then if you walk up to my door and knock on it, you're actually using my property without my consent. So I would, you could make an analogous argument, and I have before in writing, um, to different types of computer hacking and even spamming. Uh, although I would make an exception for hacking into government computers because the government is a criminal organization and <laughs> doesn't have any <laughs> property rights that are legitimate to complain about. Um, but on the, on the BitTorrent question, yeah, I would say there is – there's not only nothing legally wrong, wrong, there's nothing morally wrong with copying and sharing information. Um, I can go into this a little I – can, I can kind of give a framework for why I've come to this. I mean I've written a dozen – dozens of articles on this, and I've, I've approached – I've tried to explain it in different ways, and I think I've come across – a couple of good examples or ways of il- explaining it to people who are kind of new to this way of thinking that mm-hmm. we, we can go into. If you, it builds on what we've talked about up to this point, yeah. the way of looking at property and dispute in you know, the settlement and peace and conflict. Um, so we can go into that now or, or later if you want, yeah. or I can uh, you know start what? on let, it. Let, I think that's a longer you know, uh, thing that we need to talk about. So let's let's take mm-hmm. a break here at this point, and then we'll, we'll proceed with this in the second hour here as we, as we pick up. But uh, let's talk about your website a little bit first, of course, where people can go to, to listen to you, to read more about your works, to also pick up a copy of your uh, book as well. So, so give out the details about that, Stefan. Yeah, so my website is stephankinsella.com, S-T-E-P-H-A-N. Kinsella, K-I-N-S-E-L-L-A. And I have other websites that are linked from there. I'm a blogger on the Libertarian Standard, and I have a, a special IP-related website called C4SIF.org. That's Center for the Study of Innovative Freedom. But they're all linked from StephanKinsella.com. And I have a podcast on, on that site as well, and I have all my publications um, available for free online 
there. Um, and so I blog there and I blog other places and, um, and have links to virtually all of my, my articles there, including a lot of IP and uh, libertarian rights theory and um, legal, other, other types of libertarian legal theory. Very good. The book is Against Intellectual Property. And the website is stefankinsella.com. We'll have that linked up on redeskreations.com as well. Uh, all right, we'll continue the conversation after a short break here. So uh, stay with us, guys. Uh, thanks for this first segment, Stefan. We'll be right back with more. We will uh, proceed with more in the second hour with Stefan Kinsella about intellectual property. And considering the topic that we are talking about, I do hope that you consider signing up for a membership with us since this is how we manage to keep this network and our productions going. The truth is that if uh, everyone downloads all of our programs for free, we'd only be able to produce a, a fraction of what we do. And eventually it would be nothing at all considering that it takes time, production costs, server space, manpower and money to produce a program like we do. We also spare you from commercial breaks, of course, in our broadcasts. And we do have an ad-free website as well. So if you like what we do, don't shoot us or yourself in the foot. Support us. Sign up. You can share a membership with your family, some friends, and especially in a time like this, it couldn't be more beneficial as we are expanding. New projects are in the works and we are breaking into new territory and mediums to bring you research, interviews, new supporting and insights. Sign up for a three-month subscription. It's uh, only about the price of two cups of coffee per month. RedEyesMembers.com is the website. Thank you so much for your support. Okay, before we carry on here, though, let me uh, share some of our upcoming guests with you. Stephen Mailer, Jeffrey James, Tom Secker, and then John Rappaport will be good to have him back on Red Ice Radio this time. He did an excellent program with Lana on Radio 314 just a few weeks ago. We also have Lennon Honor and Adrian Silbucci after this. Much more in the pipeline. Thank you so much for your support. Sign up at RedEyesMembers.com, and we'll see you there right after this break. <laughs> 